What is the truth behind Harry and Meghan's massive drop in charity donations? What happened at Catherine's carol service? And why there's been another transatlantic royal clash? Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Joe Elvin and here to discuss all the big royal stories is the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, the Mail on Sunday's editor-at-large, Charlotte Griffiths, and the Daily Mail's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome to you all today. A reminder that if you enjoy great royal videos, do remember to subscribe to this channel and be kept informed of all the latest royal news. Well, it's been another busy few days, so we're going to get straight into it. Rebecca, hello. Another week, another transatlantic diary clash, this time over a video put out by William and Catherine and then followed rather swiftly by one from Harry and Meghan. What's the story? Well, we did have a lot of royal content in uh, 24 hours from the House of Windsor and the House of Montecito, that's for certain. And quite interesting because they were both, I, I thought it was very interesting, I'm sure we'll discuss it more. Uh, Harry and Meghan's offering was very much in the royal mould, I thought. So it started on the, on the Monday when um, we received a lovely video from Kensington Palace of uh, Princess of Wales taking Prince George, Princess Charlotte and little Prince Louis to Baby Bank Windsor. Now I actually had accompanied her on a visit there in April and I remember her very distinctly saying, I'm going to bring my children back one day because I want to see the incredible work that you do. Mm. And, and she did and she kept good to that promise. And you could lovely video of them getting very excitedly out of the car and carrying in some of the donations that they'd sorted out for families in need at this time of year and uh, making up gift bags for the children. Uh, and it, it, was just it was just lovely to see them kind of being children, enjoying themselves. Uh, but a very glossy video shot by a professional filmmaker, as was the one we got the next morning uh, from Archwell, which was uh, a video of the impact that Harry and Meghan had had during the year. And again, lots of very glossy shots of them hugging people going about philanthropic duties. And w what was the impact? Well, <laughs> I think I'll leave others to be the judge of that. There was a lot of hugging going on, I can tell you that. Impactful <laughs> hugging. I mean, Charlotte, what did you make of the videos? And importantly, what did you make of the timing? Well, impact-wise, the main impact was Megan just thrusting herself upon people over and over again, doing these big, deep hugs. Um, Poor, innocent, unsuspecting passers-by were just hugged at random by oh, Megan. Oh, <laughs> maybe people wanted a hug from Megan. <laughs> maybe. She seemed to just be very much trying to portray herself as Megan the hugger, the real sort of emotional arm of the royal family, although they're not part of the royal family. Um, but uh, the timing was a little awkward because, of course, it was they were hours apart, weren't they? And I think we sort of have this sort of underlying suspicion now of Megan, perhaps unfairly, that she seeks to undermine the family she left behind back in the UK. And so people started to ask questions, didn't they? You know, how, why does she release it a few hours after, after Kate's video? And yeah, you have to wonder whether there was a bit of undermining going on there. Do you think that, Richard? It does feel a bit like sort of trolling, doesn't it? The, the way <laughs> trolling. Uh, well, you just wonder what, why um, do they release it the next day? I mean, you know, they could wait a few days if they want to. They might have it ready. They've got the impact report prepared and that sort of thing. But when you've got um, William and Catherine's one one day, it, it just seems to release a video that's quite similar in some ways. Um, the next day, it's almost like they're sort of sitting there thinking, oh, when should we run this? Oh, no, let's just wait till um, the palace release a video. I don't know, it does, it kind of highlights that, um, that clash, I think. I and you can imagine Kate's reaction. She would have just been so upset, I'm sure. Do you think? Oh, I don't think And maybe so. even angry. Yeah, no, I, just, I disagree. I don't, I don't think there is anything in the timing, but I think that shows you that there is no organisation or, mm. you know, there's no cross-pollination between the two of them. They are separate organisations operating in very, very separate ways. And that that would have never happened had Harry and Meghan mm. been members of the royal family. It's interesting what you were saying about um, Meghan the hugger. When you think back to, I think it was that Netflix documentary, wasn't it, where Meghan felt rather sort of frozen out by Kate not really being a hugger. So there's, there's that, that sort yeah. of like weird contrast she's, as well. She's now made that her whole brand, that Kate's the ice queen and I'm the hugger that's in touch with my emotions. But Kate's a you know, normal person that's in touch with her emotions. She doesn't have to hug everyone all the time to really hammer home that point like Kate is clearly doing, I think. I, I also wonder with these videos, uh, is it, I, I hear what you're saying, Rebecca, that you know, there's, there's, there's no communication between the houses. So why would 
one hand know what the other one's doing. But do you think there's ever any speculation in either the Wales or the Sussexes? They think, well, Harry and Meghan might put out this kind of video, so maybe we should think about that, or vice versa. Do you know what I mean? Do you think there's ever any of that sort of preempting of what the other house is doing? I don't think so, but I do think it's fair to say that Kensington Palace have really tried to up their game in the last couple of years because we never saw those glossy videos and now we see videos put out by professional filmmakers with the Kensington Palace branding on the end. I mean, that's that's quite Hollywood in itself. Maybe there are people who think that Harry and Meghan's approach prompted them to, to up their game. I don't know, but mm. we definitely have seen a more professional approach the way... They, they do their PR, I have to say. And what do you think, Richard? I mean, I think it's pretty well established that there's not going to be any sort of cosy reunions between these two houses anytime soon. So inevitably, they're not going to coordinate diaries. So what's to be done? I mean, essentially, not much can be done. But I think it's important they don't sort of do things that are, are too similar. I mean, for me, um, the Kenston Palace videos, they're going down this route of the very slick, you know, Hollywood style video. It does make me slightly uneasy, I must say. It's, it's sort of not, when, when I think of the royal family, I think of, um, you know, Prince Philip and the Queen. I just can't imagine them doing this type of video. I think they're sort of vulnerable to being kind of led by, you know, PR people who want them to be these kind of slick celebrities, um, you know, stars of these films. when. That, that's not what the royal family is. So I, th I think it's important um, to make that difference. And if Harry and Meghan want to go down that route, great. But certainly, um, royal family here um, shouldn't feel the need to compete. Well, we'll return to the Sussexes and a story about their charity finances in a couple of minutes. Before that, Rebecca, there was also a bit of fuss online this week, wasn't there, over the Wales' Christmas card this year? Yeah, I thought this was a bit harsh. I think the kind of internet conspiracy theorists were out there because they well, issued... I, I've been very influenced by the white shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you have, yeah. actually. Maybe they should be interest, influenced by your feathers next time and your socks. So they put the picture out that's going to be on the front of their annual Christmas card along with the, the King and the Queen's um, version at the weekend. And it was a real marked difference to the ones that we've seen in recent years. What we're talking about homespun, you know, they're all very much out of the country, fresh air, ruddy cheeks. This was, I felt, going back to the days of the kind of Charles and Diana kind of stage formal, you know, portrait Slick. photographs. Yeah, of them all in kind of white shirts and kind of trousers and uh, a very kind of, I suppose, kind of Bowden Gap style kind of... Ralph you know, Lauren. Vi yeah, exactly. Ralph that Lauren kind of vitality yeah. about it. Now, I have to be fair, people on the internet are very quick to spot these things, but they kind of, they spotted that Prince, jo uh, Prince uh, Louis, sorry, his hand seemed to be placed a bit oddly and did he appear to have a finger missing and could they see William's leg? But, I mean, how they spot this stuff, I don't know. I mean, I, I spoke to people who said, we promise you this isn't photoshopped. It obviously kids stand in funny positions and William's legs behind the chair. Yeah. But it didn't stop an acre of speculation over it. What do you think, Charlotte? I mean, aside from the fact that, I don't know about you, I didn't get a Christmas card. Did anyone at Palace Conf Confidential get a Christmas card from I haven't got one else's? yet. <laughs> Rebecca, you actually probably will. <laughs> no, I haven't. Got, I have got another Christmas card, but not have from, you, from really? Really? <laughs> uh, Well, you know, Royal Mail really letting the side down, I think. But, uh, but, did they get the tone right, apart from uh, that? For me, no. I didn't like the backdrop. It looked a little bit like they walked into a Snappy Snaps on the high street and they had that horrible grey backdrop. And I don't know, I, I kind of agree with you that the whole point of the remaining royals is that they're regal and they need to just own their regal vibes and just look I mean how great does Kate look when she's incredibly poised wearing some really smart clothes a bit of netting across her face looking into the distance and but that's, that's not, their brand. That's not massively relatable though is it? In, but why a, should a... they be relatable? I mean they are the royals there were, there were two future kings in that picture can't they just look like kings? I'm not saying that George has to be dressed up like a little mini king or anything but one day these guys will be, you know, ruling the nation, you know, and with a crown on. And I just kind of, that's the vibe I want from them. Well, I thought it was fine. Did it you? was perfectly fine. nice and fine. Yeah. That's I not to... interesting enough. <laughs> <laughs> I do yeah. agree with Charlotte, though. I, it wasn't my favourite. But then, you see, I like the family ones that give us, a, you know, that are out in the gardens at Amna, that just give us a bit into the insight of the kind of happy family I, life they have. I, I like your those. Christmas card tradition where, you're, where you get your son to draw one. I think they should do that. 
I th well, I think that would go down a storm if yeah. those children were to draw one. Yeah, I think, 100%. yeah, it's a brilliant yeah. idea. Yeah. Yeah. They should steal that from Rebecca English. Let, let's move on, Richard. A report in the Sunday Telegraph broke down who had done the most royal engagements this year and what, what was found. Oh, I love these royal reports. I know you do. So it's, it's, that, it's that time of year <laughs> you, when you it's... You get to mark everyone's homework. <laughs> exactly, yeah. the sort of competitive side. There was a real insight into this in Prince Harry's book where he talked about how members of the royal family pretend not to care at all. Oh, we don't care about these tables. <laughs> but actually they're desperate to kind of get higher up. And he would talk about the sort of efforts that they would go to make sure they appeared at the top. Well, the Sunday Telegraph did one. It's a bit, bit early. Come on, we're not at the end of the year yet. But so far... Um, it's Princess Anne, <laughs> almost inevitably, in the lead with about, it's about 450 engagements so far, I think. Good Lord, there's only 365 yeah. days in a year. <laughs> exactly, yeah. so I think she, she really packs them in. Yeah. Um, second was the King, it was King Charles, he was about 30 behind his sister. What a slacker. But there's still about a week or so to go, so you know, he might catch up. Third place, uh, I think, was um, Prince Edward. Um, and fourth was Queen Camilla. Mm. Um, so it went down. Um, William and Catherine um, came later. You know, we've had the recent criticism from um, <coughs> Owen Scobie about <laughs> Catherine being a part-time royal in his words. But there's an element of truth in that, in the sense that they, they want to spend more time with their children. So Hang on a minute. Did you just agree with Owen Scobie about something? <laughs> well, I'd say he agrees with me. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still waiting for my Christmas card from him. Yeah, by the way, odd, but, odd that one. Um, but no, the, the point is that Catherine's trying to raise our future king and uh, the children is a very important job. So it shouldn't be kind of seen that that's like not working hard. She's doing that in addition to engagements. Um, so you would always expect someone like Princess Anne to do more. Um, but the point that Prince Harry made in his memoirs was that they, they, they kind of do all sorts of tricks to boost their numbers. So they'll, they'll pack in about four in a day or they'll just have a meeting and say, oh, that's another engagement. And he was saying, you know, it, it's silly to see it in those terms because um, they'll do lots of things that are not listed because they might be seen as more private or, or something they don't necessarily want to list or just preparation. You might have a big engagement the next day that you spend the whole day preparing for. Um, so it's a bit silly, but it's a bit of um, Christmas fun, should we say. Well, it Ticky gives us something to talk papers, about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rebecca, were there any surprises for you in the figures? Not massively. I mean, it's always a bit of a tussle between Charles and Anne. And to be fair to the king, he's now, he's now our head of state, so he has a lot of red boxes to deal with state business. So I'd always have expected his engagement numbers to go down slightly. And I don't think that reflects the current workload he has. Um, the Prince and Princess of Wales, they are always a bit low down. I think this, as we said, it highlights um, the balance that they're trying to find, which is uh, they also want to focus on a smaller number of charities and get more intimately involved in those charities. But that does mean less public engagements. Now, obviously, Queen Elizabeth was always of the opinion you have to be seen to be believed. Royalty has to be seen to be believed. And I think that highlights, are, are they, you know, questions might rise, are they getting that balance right? But as, as Richard rightly points out, they've also made very clear that their other really big job is bringing their family up and being mm. good parents. And as someone who's a working mum who every day beats herself up about, have I got the right balance between family and work? I know Richard and Charlotte and you will all say the same. Can I judge them for wanting to spend as much time with their family. No, no, I can't, and it wouldn't be fair to. And I think that's what we saw in that lovely video of the three children going to the baby bank, is actually they're bringing up three really happy, well-adjusted kids who are comfortable enough with the spotlight on them without being overexposed yeah. to it. So I think those numbers do reflect that balance that they're, they're trying to find. And then, of course, Charlotte, they also reflect that perhaps Princess Anne is really the key to the whole thing. Yeah, she is. She's the backbone of the royal family. I think more power to her. But we know that about Anne, don't we? Well, when, when she I was going to say, when she, she was turning 70, I did a big profile on her for the mail and I persuaded the palace because she doesn't like the media on her engagements to let me follow her around for a few days. And the pace she sets, um, she was packing in four or five engagements a day and going from kind of lifeboats to 
you know, things for the Red Cross. You know, it was it was such a wide variety. And when of stuff, the seventy-year-old woman is doing that, nobody can dare go. Oh, man, I'm a bit tired. <laughs> she, yeah. Can we bam, stop for a sandwich? Bam, bam. We we were in a car, you know, trying to catch up with her or get ahead to the next engagement that she was doing, and it was a cracking pace she was And setting. it's really cold, grey work she's doing. Yeah. She's out there in December in the rain, you know, cutting ribbons outdoors. It's, it's you know, whereas the Montecito crew are, like, you know, doing gr glossy sort of sunshine photo calls all the time, but she's... I don't think you'll see a Princess Anne impact video anytime uh, soon, put it I that way. She doesn't care whether people no. want to thank her or not, she just yeah. gets on with it. I think for Sorry, me it does highlight the, the problems though of looking towards a slimmed down monarchy, you know, which has always been King Charles's thing. It was meant to be with Harry and Meghan and with William and Catherine. But, you know, you've seen the Princess Anne and Prince Edward, Sophie, they do so much yeah. that without them, the royal family would just be so diminished, in my opinion, that that's the mistake of, of going down that route. Mm. Before we get to the comments this week, I just wanted to let you know there's a date for your diary coming up. 28th of December, we'll have a very special post-Christmas episode where Richard will look just like James Bond. <laughs> he wrote that. I didn't write that. But you don't want to miss it in either case. Right, on to your thoughts. And a record number of you commented on last week's show. More than four and a half thousand and counting. Thank you so much. And here are some of them. Claire DeSabia says, please don't think all Americans are like Megan. We are not. Most of us are happy with what life gives us. Valerie Vidotto says, as much as I understand the king not wanting to do anything, I believe he must. His own mother had to do the same with her son, Andrew. I can only imagine how hard it would be but it must be done. No one believes anything Meghan and Harry says anymore, so it would not look bad on the king, but if, it allow, if he allows them to keep doing it, it will look badly on his majesty. While Farrah King says that she, quote unquote, totally agrees with Richard Eden that Harry should be removed from the line of succession. So too does Jan Siri, who says Richard is so right, remove titles, remove Henry's, Henry's Councillor of State status, remove him and his children from the line of succession, Heaven forbid, but if King Henry ever became a reality, that would destroy the monarchy. Susan Seat has some advice for His Majesty, saying the King needs to protect the monarchy and put his personal feelings aside. And we have a question from Alexisa now. I have a question, she says. What are your thoughts about Harry telling the High Court that he was forced to leave the royal family? It was very surprising to me considering Harry recorded his freedom flight when leaving, which was played in their Netflix documentary. That's an interesting point. Rebecca, what do you think? It's becoming a bit of an overused phrase now, but I think it definitely, that's classed under recollections may vary. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, whoever knew that we would still be using that phrase so many years on. Um, and I think it's worth pointing out that I've written this because he told me this, and as he's told many other journalists over the years, Harry, that he never wanted to be a member of the royal family. He longed to go off and live in Africa and, and be a safari guide or work in conservation. I remember him telling me that years ago. So there was always that thought in the back of his mind that it may be not the life choice that he wanted. And somebody else pointed out to me when that story came out last week that, um, and this has been demonstrably proved, that Meghan, very shortly after she joined the royal family, she was looking at other commercial deals that she could do at the time, was exploring programming and linking up. So I think it, it, it's, yeah, recollections may vary on the suggestion that they were forced out, shall yeah, we say. Yeah, and well, a question now from what might be M.T. Snow Wolf, and apologies if that's not right, but they ask, can you strip a prince of the title of prince? I know you can, the Duke and Duchess titles. Richard, I bet you know this, don't you? Well, it's, it is a, a tricky one, because essentially, you know, as people have pointed out, um, if um, King Charles did what I and lots of our viewers would like to see, and um, strip Harry and Meghan of their Duke and Duchess of Sussex titles. I'm sure it would please lots of people in Sussex as well, it should be said. Um, they would then become Prince Henry of Wales and Princess Henry. So to actually strip the Prince titles, that's another matter. But what I would say is the King can pretty much do whatever he likes. You know, he can put a bill through Parliament um, saying that, you know, in addition to them being stripped of their the dukedom, uh, I would like him not to be referred anymore as a prince. It probably, 
you know, it wouldn't really have legal standing. As the, the son of a king, he is still a prince. But certainly it would have a lot of effect, and he certainly couldn't um, be styling himself prince in any kind of official documents or anything like that. So, I mean, that would really um, show the strength of his feeling. But I think, let's not put the cart before the horse. <laughs> a basic step would be to get rid of those, the, the dukedom titles and the other things such as councillor of state. Well, you know, stranger things have happened in royal history, so let's see. But please keep those thoughts and questions coming in below. And if you haven't already, join in the debate in our lively comments section. Now let's get back to my panel. And when they left the royal family, the Sussexes said that their charitable foundation, Archwell, would be at the heart of their work. Well, this week, figures released suggested that the donations are down significantly this year. Rebecca, you covered this story. What are the key things to know? As you said, donations down massively, I think, from about $13 million to $2 million. Well, didn't they have one generous benefactor last year? They did week? last year. Yeah, yeah, I'll come to that. Yeah. And then, So out of the $2 million that they got in the last year, it was a million each from two anonymous donors. As a result, not surprisingly, the amount of grants they've given out has, has lowered. Um, but what is interesting is their running costs are still pretty high and they're paying five members of staff around $700,000 in salaries in the wow. year, which means they're basically running effectively at a loss in the last year of about $600,000. Now, I think it's important in terms of accuracy and fairness to point out that they do have about eight million dollars in the bank and they do expect that to rise next year so it's not like it's a bankrupt organization in any way shape or form but it does show that finances are, are certainly less healthy when they than when they started it can it forgive me if this is an ignorant question but it, is it fundamentally a, a charity or is it a, a business it's no, it's a charity, but obviously there's lots yeah. of link-ups with their Archwell production business. It all comes under the same umbrella. This is very much a charity, and the reason why we know the information we do is under the IRS, they've had to, and because they're a charity, they've had to submit yeah. accounts. But they've obviously made fascinating reading, and there's, there's been a real effort, I think, on their behalf since it came out to try and stress or emphasise from their point of view that the charity is still in a very healthy place. What do you think, Charlotte? Could it be that it, it just doesn't really excite people as a place to donate to? What, what, what's the theory behind why it's dropped so much? Well, I don't know. The two, the two big do donations that they have had for about a million each is, have only come from two different people this time, and they were both anonymous. So my personal theory is that they're lobbying their very wealthy circle of Montecito friends to donate and that maybe a few of their friends did do some mega donations last year. I don't know, maybe they got Oprah or something to donate, but, but they've done their donations now. So this year, their mates aren't donating in their droves because they already did that last year. And, and to, to speak to what you said, you know, the eight million quid is there and you know, the, the big donations have already been made. So maybe that's where the drops come from. Mm. That's my guess. What, what do you think, Richard, what sort of picture have you built up of the charity in your mind after these reports and what of the role of, a, of somebody called James Holt? Well, look, I don't like to be too cynical um, but I'm pretty sceptical about this whole organisation. I'm feeling cynical about you saying you don't <laughs> like to be cynical. You know our viewers who you know might have had the misfortune to watch Harry and Meghan's Netflix documentary will have seen James Holt extensively go on and on about how wonderful they are and you know, talking like this. Well, who is he? He he used to work actually for William and Catherine, but um, he decided to go with the Sussexes to California, and he's been rewarded very handsomely. He's paid a total of about um, hundred, I think it's about two hundred thousand dollars in in total for his job. Which, to put it in perspective, is probably more than any official who works at Buckingham Palace for the royal family here. So perhaps you can see why he's gone. Do you think, Rebecca, it's fair to equate? Meghan and Harry's success with that of their charity? Well, certainly the assumption that people are making, um, and there was a, there was a, there's a definite buzz, I think, when they started Archwell, that they were going to be building this big, global, thrusting, philanthropic organisation. And there was a lot of positivity and optimism about that charity, but also about them. And I think we've seen that turn on its head a lot in the last year. You know, they've been lampooned in things like South Park. Um, I think other stories will come on to Hollywood Reporter. Mm. Um, and 
there's less of a buzz about them now. People are more either ambivalent or actively dislike what they've done. I mean, can we say that that's translated to their charitable work? I, I don't know, but that's certainly the assumption people are drawing. Mm. It's certainly interesting that those generous donors chose to remain anonymous, I think. Mm. You know, you might think people would be proud of their association. They'd want to say, I support it, so you should too. But no, they wanted to remain anonymous. I mean, Archwell have said that um, when we ask questions, well, often you'll get a big donation to kickstart you off in your first year, and it, it calms down a bit after that. And they've also said that we um, were maybe reassessing whether we want to give out so much in the way of grants, but I don't know, they do seem fairly unsatisfactory explanations to me. It's interesting you mentioned the Hollywood Reporter there, Rebecca. I mean, there's, there's been, there was such Hollywood sycophancy at one point for Meghan and Harry, and now we've got this publication naming them among their losers of 2023. What, what did you make of that? It's such a savage takedown if you actually read what The Hollywood Reporter wrote. It's only a paragraph, but they fit it all in there. They've got the South Park docu documentary, the fact that their podcast, they were described by, uh, as grifters by the guy who produced their podcast. Um, they described the podcast as inert. It's really, really savage, and you just know Megan will be reading this because, you know, Hollywood is where she's from. She loves Hollywood. She will be really mortified to have had this savage takedown. And they've listed um, 10 other sort of losers. And one of them actually is Bob Iger, their great friend from Disney, uh, who they work quite closely with. So he's savagely taken down as well. And yeah, they're not in good company on this sort of losers list. It's, it's pretty harsh. And Richard, there was an interesting report in The Sun at the weekend suggesting that the King was now changing tack on his approach to Harry. This was really interesting. I mean, the, the headline on the front of the paper was emotional blackmail. And that's um, a phrase which, according to the, this newspaper, um, that King Charles had used with friends, um, referring to the, the way that Harry and Meghan are making him feel. Now, it wasn't quite clear what they mean, but I, I think it was in reference to Omid Scobie, to use his name again, his, his book, and you know this accidental naming of these royal racists and that sort of thing. And is that, because remember, you know, that follows on from the Oprah interview and it feels like there's a bit of pressure, um, he feels there's pressure put on him by them um, to sort of get what they want. And we've seen that before with, with Harry openly saying, I will only agree to this if I get this, if I get this. And he's telling friends, I'm not going to give in to that sort of thing. Mm. Well, I'm pleased he's not. You know, and I, I don't think anyone should give in to that sort of emotional blackmail, if you want to call it that. Well, what do you think, Charlotte? Is it a wise move? I think it's a really wise move, and it shows that Charles now, as king, is really laying down the law a bit, and he just sounds exhausted. The, the phrase emotional blackmail just, to me, speaks to just a man who's just absolutely sick and tired of it, and actually is pretty important and powerful now, and is just done with the whole Meghan and Harry emotional blackmail. And I remember being on Palace Confidential a couple of years ago, thinking and discussing how they, there was this nuclear button, which was the naming of the royal racists that, that um, Meghan and Harry had over the royal family. And that's sort of fizzled out now, because we know the names, we think we know the names, and actually most people didn't really care or invest too heavily in, in the belief that these people are actually racist. So that's kind of gone now, that's dissipated. So yeah, so Charles is just done with it. He's done with being blackmailed by the, the emotions and the naming of the royal racists. Well, one person apparently, Rebecca, who, who definitely approves of Charles's approach is good old Father Christmas. Uh, we know because they met last week and before you tell us about it, here's a clip. <laughs> This must have been a fun one to watch. It was. I think I alluded it to it, to it in last week's programme, but I couldn't say too much. But what I loved about this engagement, we were in this kind of rainy, cold, uh, Ealing Broadway shopping centre. That's what you loved, was it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, but there was a Christmas market and there were children singing carols. And I love the fact that he's now king, he's head of state. But he still, like everybody, gets excited meeting the big man. And he saw, we were, we were standing by Fa Father Christmas's grotto, and we, I saw the king kind of turn around and look, and he was like pointing and like kind of going, yay! Yeah. 
And then he made, he wasn't actually meant to meet Father Christmas, but he made a beeline for him. That is so cute. And it is very sweet. And uh, Father Christmas told him that uh, he was very much at the top of his good list this year. And he just kind of went, oh, really? And he was just very excited. And I thought, how sweet. You know, you may be 75 now, but everyone's got a childish enthusiasm enthusiasm for Christmas. Again, the conundrum of what to buy the king for Christmas after your splendid hot nuts birthday present oh, I, don't know. Yes. I, don't know, I don't know where we go from there <laughs> it must be it well i have to say i mean i'd love to see what his letter to santa said yeah a few things we could think that he might wish yeah. for but let, let's let's move on let's let's just quickly talk about catherine princess of wales after last week's show you were going to her annual carols concert how, how was it and apparently a certain prince louis was up to hijinks again Oh, it, you know, it was genuinely lovely, and I think it's their third year now, and it's starting to become a, a kind of a feature, and they're really getting into their stride. I don't want to give too many of the secrets away because everyone can watch it. I think on ITV One and ITVX at seven forty-five, I think, on Christmas Eve. Um, but it was a really lovely mix of contemporary music as well as the amazing um, choir there at Westminster Abbey. The Abbey was kind of decked out in Christmas trees that the King had had cut down from the Windsor Estates, although they couldn't be Oof. there. He sent it and they had all these kind of eco-friendly decorations. And it, the people there were so delighted to be there. They were invited because they had done incredibly good things in their community. And it was just such a lovely festive event. And I had an inkling that all three kids were going to go, but we wouldn't be quite sure until they got there because obviously they had a long day at school. But they did, and there was a post box outside that Kate had asked to be put there that guests going could post a letter that would be distributed to some of the children helped by her charities during the year. And George Sharp and Louis straight away went and posted their letters. It was very sweet. And they were given, can we were all given candles as we were singing some of the carols. And I could see Louis being given a cow, and I thought, that that's brave, yeah. like five-year-old <laughs> with a candle. What could possibly go wrong? But they, they were great. But as they came out, you kind of saw him, and he obviously couldn't resist leaning over to Charlotte and kind of blowing her candle out. And she had that look on her face, was going, yeah, here we are, yeah. younger brothers, that's what they do. <laughs> it, was, it was just a very sweet family occasion. I think really sets the tone after a very tumultuous year which has got great high points but some really you know sad low points that it was just bringing everyone together I thought it was lovely oh mm. lovely well sticking with the Princess of Wales's carol service which has already become a key part of the royal Christmas calendar there were so many beautiful pictures this year that we decided to turn it into this week's montage enjoy <laughs> you weren't feeling Christmassy already, that has got to have done it. Just wanted to remind any of our viewers who are also fans of The Crown on Netflix, you will enjoy The Mail's new podcast. It's called The Crown Fact or Fiction. You can join The Mail on Sunday's Royal Correspondent Natasha Livingston and Royal Biographer and Mail Columnist Robert Hardman for a watch along of The Crown's final season and find out which scenes are fact and which are fiction. There'll be a podcast to accompany every episode of the brand new sixth season of The Crown with some very special guests there too. Rumour has it, one Rebecca English. <laughs> Rumour has it. So search for The Crown of Fact or Fiction wherever you get your podcasts. For now, thank you to Rebecca, Charlotte and Richard and to you for watching. A reminder to like and subscribe, particularly so you don't miss our very special 28th of December Christmas issue. But we will see you next week on Palace Confidential. Bye-bye.